and that's just like one of those things that I've had on my foot for a long time. So I was hoping I could just get it lanced off, but then it came out and it actually tried to eat my neighbor. So Do not piss off the foot manatee. I I've tried not to. I don't I don't know if I didn't give it enough sacrifice. Oh, hey, we're on. Ooh. Hey, everybody. <laughs> hey, nothing wrong here. <laughs> uh -oh. Everything's perfectly fine. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Scene Snobs Podcast. With your hosts of the Scene Snob, Michael Kimball. And the commander and geek himself, Casey Plot. Holler at your boy. Well, it is a pleasure to be here once again with all you wonderful, fine, fancy folk. Hopefully you uh, survived our first, the pilot, and you've returned yep. for round two. We should we gotta figure the out what to call this episode. The Awakening. The Awakening. You named it right there. Okay, boom. I like uh, it. Hopefully we have enough, uh, enough presence of mind to not make the same mistakes we made last week, like me sounding like an idiot just laughing after everything that was said. It's gonna, that's going to be hard. We were always good for that, though. Yeah, that is. People always seem to like that. Yeah, we're big fans. Yeah. <laughs> I, like, I like my chuckles. That's true. I mean, too. Uh, it makes me feel like somebody's in the room. Yeah, exactly. A live studio audience. Bingo. Uh, Our own Cosby audience. Oof. Yeah, I don't know why I went there. <laughs> Oof. Maybe don't. cheers? No, no I'm not like, taking that can't drink. Can't back. <laughs> Keep that drink over there. Um, anyway, now we're getting dark. Don't mind the fizzing. Well, Casey... Uh, how was your weekend? Michael, I had a fantastic weekend. So this was a really crazy busy weekend mm -hmm. that started for me about two weeks ago when I started building my daughter's costume. Yeah. She was a Kyoshi warrior from Avatar The Last Airbender, uh, Suki to be precise because of the headband, that's how you would know. So and I only know this because of hours of studying and research. So thank you interwebs. Uh, it went really well. We had a great time. We went to Jellystone out in the Ray. And, yep, we stay out in the cabins out there and just have a great time with the kids. The kids do a ton of trick-or-treating. There's pumpkin painting. There's tie-dyeing. She got to do all of it, and she had a blast. So that was a lot of fun. Um, and I spent most of my time just prepping that dang costume. Oh, yeah. But, but the, I tell you, the payoff was great, man. She loved it. She had a blast in it, and the face paint's her favorite part. The face paint, the headband, and the fans. She would have been fine with nothing else, but, you know. Got to go big or go home. The thing I think I like about it the most is that making her it was a Kyoshi warrior. You said mm -hmm. right? Yes. I didn't watch Avatar: The Last Airbender, so I don't I don't know it well. Mm -hmm. But when I saw the costume, I looked up the um, the uh, pictures, and I'm like, you nailed it. It's well, great thanks, for buddy. a homemade costume. Like that is a great costume. Thanks, man. I think it would be even better than buying the ones that fall apart. Yeah, that's the thing. Yeah. Is there so many out there that fall apart, and all I had to do was buy that leather from Walmart, the actual the two yards of it cost me 13 bucks. And who else is going as Kayashi Warrior? Yeah, nobody. Nobody. And there were like eight people who recognized her, and the ones that got it were like, oh, that's great! And they all like shouted yep. with excitement, so I was like, alright, cool. And River got way into it when they did that. She, she whipped the fans out, started like, ah, doing her poses. It was wonderful. Oh, yeah. Like, I, I mean, you know, my kid wants to go as uh, Drift from Fortnite. Oh, okay. Yeah. I don't know video games that well. Mm -hmm. You know, I respect them, and that's your world. Yep. So I let you d do the talking on them. But, uh, I, you know, like I played Fortnite like, maybe once or twice, and there's no way I know which characters are who and who's famous or whatnot. And so he was showing it to me, and I'm like, okay, we can make this. Yeah. And, but they want the costumes. I know. That's the thing is the kids want the costumes, and it's so hard because you see some of them, and they're worth it. But then I also remember the costumes we grew up, which were literally the plastic and a mask inside of a cardboard box that you walked by, and there were like 50 options mm -hmm. to choose from. And it was the simple stuff. Like, even their comic book characters, it was just, it's just a simple face mask, you yeah. know, and just a simple plastic, like, almost feels like a poncho, basically, <laughs> and locked in every ounce of heat that you could fathom, so it made the night miserable if it was a warm October night. Oh, God, yeah. But, yeah, all those costumes, man, like, the prices are outrageous. They have gotten so high, and it's just, and they're, you're a mark. You're a mark every time you go in. And I, I'm a mark when I go into those Halloween stores. I know they're gunning for me, and they're oh, usually yeah. pretty successful. So. See, I'm all about, uh, yeah, the costumes are cool, but it's kind of like, what can I scare my kids with? You know, like, right, yeah. Yeah, it does this Freddy Krueger mask look good, so my kids will, like, never sleep again. That's Yeah, how, um, how extreme is it? Like, I have that scarecrow, and all I want to do is build off that scarecrow mask, because I love the idea of being a terrifying scarecrow. I don't think I saw your scarecrow costume. Oh, yeah, I've got a good one. So I have to see that. Yeah. Um, 
So that, I mean, but it was a great costume, and sounds like a fun weekend. I mean, we've yeah. done it before, so, like, yep. I know Jellystone's a great place to go, yeah. especially during Halloween. Uh, and they do a great trick-or-treating for the kids and stuff. And she's at that amazing age where she can just go play on the playground, she can go yeah. down, bounce on the bouncies, everything's golden. We're right there. We can see her fine, you know, she's big enough and she's comfortable yeah. enough in telling people, you know, get out of my face and running away. So I'm good. Like, that's what I was waiting for. She's reached that point. <laughs> that is a nice age, right? Yep, I love it. Oh, yeah, because um, I, have, I still have my three-year-old who is not at that age. Yes. And it's like, okay, I'll take you. No problem. Because you are still the big toy as well. That's yeah. the other problem. Is we are the coolest toy to our kids until they find their other children out there. <laughs> but he's starting to slowly find that, and he's just kind of like, okay, Daddy, leave me alone. You're not as cool as you once were, Dad. <laughs> yeah, which is fine by me. Yep, no, I'm I mean, I still want to be cool. It's like bittersweet. It's like, okay, I got to rest. But fine have fun <laughs> so yeah it's that it's always that trade-off man say lovey <laughs> yeah. well but no i mean that, that does sound like a great weekend uh so how was your weekend sir it was fun man was i know you time. had psychorama i saw the pictures it looks rad and i also see that there's a new hellraiser yes face. my hellraiser face <laughs> your hellraiser face of course gotta love you now mind. have ash <laughs> sleep away camp but, uh, wait, wait, Ming the Merciless. Ming the Merciless, yeah. And Hellraiser. Pinhead, yeah, wow. so Pinhead, Ming the Merciless, Ash, and uh, Ash from Evil Dead is very important. Uh, yes, Ash from Evil Dead, yes. And then, um, no, I'm sorry, Evil Dead 2. I'm an mm -hmm. idiot. I don't know why, that was like right at the beginning. And then Angela from Sleepaway Camp. And Angela. So it is, and it's the face. So yeah, anybody who's a horror fan out there, it's the face. <laughs> well, but I'm sure if they're actually watching this on YouTube right now, they'll see one of those pictures scroll by. Oh, they might, yeah. <laughs> you know what? Why don't I take a picture of it and then make sure I put up at this moment <laughs> what exactly it is I'm talking about? Pretty but I will psychic. say, um, hands down, it was a fun time this weekend. Uh, so it was a fun time this weekend. So basically, Psycho Cinema, which we talked about in our first episode, is a club we belong to out here. Mm -hmm. um, they do at the Alamo Draft House in uh, Winchester, and they show cult films. Like, it can be kung fu movies. Like, uh, it can be horror movies. And to the 36 Chambers, they did, uh, uh, what's the other room? The Street Fighter with the, um, yeah, the Street Fighter. Uh, Sonny Chiba. Uh, they, they've done so much, and it's not just horror. I mean, mostly it's an emphasis on horror, but they've done so many fun, cool things. And um, they've got a lot of fun stuff coming up, but they do Psychorama, which is the overnight sleepover. Mm -hmm. every, and they do it every six months, and you spend all night in the theater watching six or seven movies. And last night was the Monster Mash one, and it was fun. Oh, and what movies were they? So I can only name five of the six. Okay. Not allowed to promote one, so it's Wait, secret for real. Yes. Oh, okay. Legit. Right. You were not. Oh, I'm dang. not allowed okay. to say anything about it. It was if you were there, you got to see ah, it. Ah, okay, Roger that. And uh, it's a rights issue. Nope, understood. So completely. I'm not saying a yep, word. Gotcha. Um, not getting anybody in trouble. Blah blah blah. So it started out with um, the Manitou. Okay. Which has changed my life <laughs> because. The Manitou is a uh, 70s horror movie okay. about a Native American witch doctor right. growing out of the neck of a woman and a <laughs> Tony Curtis plays a psychic who has to team up with a current Native American medicine man whom they, they do not call Native American throughout this entire movie. It is truly a testament of what the times was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they call him the savage? Okay, maybe maybe a truly a testament of better times than when they called Native American savages. Okay, all right, so we're not yeah. that far back. Okay. Uh, I mean, they use the term Indian, yeah, fair. which I am not agreeing to. I'm not because saying, it's the wrong country. <laughs> 100%. <laughs> but at the same time, like, I'm just saying, at the time, oh, in the no, 70s, fair, yeah. that was nomenclature. Yes, it was. So, I'm not agreeing with it. Before we became more woke. I'm not saying I'm woke. I'm just saying, I, but you shouldn't. Like, it's wrong is wrong. It, well, yeah, if it's not and, right. Like, you called them Indians because you were geographically stupid. Mm -hmm. You know? And that's just not how it was. So, like, Native American actually works. Mm -hmm. 
you know, or as some like to say, real owners of this land. Or those land bridge crossers. I mean, depending on how back of the date you want to get the really credit to. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, the BC era. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so, but anyway. It's, so, uh, Manitou so, so is it's, about a not of American. It is a bonkers movie, yeah. dude. It is bonkers. It is out there. I've always seen, because I worked at a few uh, uh, video stores, and it was there. It mm -hmm. was in the horror section. And I was always like, what is this about? And I always thought Manatee. Right. And I don't know why, because I know Manatee is different from Manatee. So the most deadly sea cow of all. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So and after Jaws, how would you really get that? I mean, come on. Oh, my God. It just slowly floats towards you and then lays on you? Probably. Mm -hmm. That's, I mean, a, that's actually pretty terrifying underwater, to think about it. <laughs> it, was, it was, but this movie, like a Manitou is basically, everything has a Manitou. Okay. And you can anger that Manitou, or you can appease that Manitou. You know, it's 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 the thing. It's the essence of everything. Is it like Jobu in Major League? It's more powerful than Jobu in Major League. Bro, you've never you seen better space put out room. Freaking chicken! Until you see space room and lasers, you can't talk. Die right, fair. You need to watch Manitou before you piss off the technology Manitou. I don't and want this to whole that. show just goes completely. It just blows up in our faces. Microphones and everywhere. And Scales. now, I realize by saying this and describing it, I'm talking to the hardened cult classic fans yes, that have seen are. this movie. All seven of them. Dude, it has Tony Curtis and Burgess Meredith in it. Whoa. And I found, like, because the facts that came with it, um, when they talk about it, uh, they both did it because they were going through divorces and needed the money. <laughs> and it's That's a, amazing. It's insane. I'm surprised Elliot Gold didn't show up. He might not have been at divorce rate yet. <laughs> or just finished. Yeah, there you go. But, um, yeah, so, like, that was the first movie. Second movie, Howling 2, Your oh, Sister Was a Werewolf. Amazing. Classic. Um, I think I've seen it, really it maybe is. twice in my life, and I love all Howling things related. Once. And I remember I watched it because I watched the Howling, and I'm like, well, 2 can't be bad. Oh, yeah, it's awful. And it has Christopher Lee in it. Yeah. And little did I know that Christopher Lee absolutely hated this movie and does not want to be credited of ever having been in it. Oh, wow. Um, well, didn't, you know. Kind of dumb against his will. Yeah. And, um, well, I mean, he agreed, so yeah. if that's it, it is what it is. You're in the movie. You got to pay. But, oh, my God, was it a fun movie. So those two movies were so bonkers and, and just, it was fun. It started out fun. Then we get Hellraiser. Ugh. Which... Well, Hellraiser being right there. What time is this now? We have like three a.m. This is yeah. It's it's around there. It's okay. like three or four. No, four. Oh wow. No, was it four? No, no. I mean, it was around three. Okay, but, but still, Frank I mean, and Hooker started at five. Frank and Hooker. We'll get there. We'll get there. Because <laughs> Hellraiser, like what I've said before, is always one of my favorites. Oh one yeah, of my yeah, top. absolutely. But only the first one. Not one of my favorites. Yes, exactly. Because you're not a big fan of the gore or gruesome. Now, no, did just, seeing it on the big screen change at all? No, because it's, okay. again, and, but again, I have a lot of respect for Hellraiser, just because it's not one of my favorites. Yeah. Like, I mean, I have respect for a lot of horror movies. Like, I have respect for Psycho and what it did. I have respect for Texas Chainsaw Massacre mm -hmm. and what it did. And it's not so much the gore that bothers me, is, but it's the, like, they're not my go-tos. Like, you have go-tos. Yeah, that is And that's fair. what it is. And yeah. Like, Scream is a go-to for me. But yeah. a lot of people may watch that and be like, this is kind of lame. Like, and I would get that. Because mm -hmm. they don't understand at that time what the movie did. And what we were going through as horror fans. Well, as horror fans, and also Scream is one of those few movies that hit us right in our wheelhouse at that point in high school. Exactly. At that point of our lives. Where just a lot of that Kevin Williamson, those mm -hmm. guys really tied in and knew how to talk to our generation. Exactly. So Exactly. That's why... Oh, excuse me. Um, but watching that... But Hellraiser never spoke to me. But I was like, it's one of those movies I was like, I have to see this when, when I was at the video store and stuff. Because like, I was older when I saw it. Yeah. And uh, I, was, I like when I say older, I was a teenager. I was in high mm -hmm. school when I first saw it for the first time. But um, I was, I didn't know. But I had met Doug Bradley before I saw it. Get out, really? Yes, but I knew who Pinhead was. Yeah, well, because Pinhead's iconic. I and mean, the, you see him always plastered on shows and commercials and stuff. I never thought about this, but I should preface that I saw Hellraiser 2 before Hellraiser 1 without realizing I didn't see mm -hmm. Hellraiser 1. Mm -hmm. Because I was younger when I saw Hellraiser 2. Okay. And there was a TV edit 
Oh yeah, and which is always yeah, because that was my first experience with the TNT and USA is with all TV ads. Yes. So I never had experienced Hellraiser. All I knew was something my mattress could kill me, and that mm-hmm. was terrifying. And it wasn't until I was like that mid-teens, like fourteen, fifteen, when I sat down and watched all those rated R scary movies uncut, and I went, "Oh wow, Hellraiser oh, yeah. got me." House two got me like there well, we're just, getting there too oh man there's just certain movies like that that just went oh no this was scary and now somehow it became more terrifying even though I'm older and shouldn't be as messed up about this like it just, yeah it was, it was screwy but yeah always love Pinhead and it, it, it's just to me they're one of those things that you say resonates with you when you say a, a movie that really resonated with you for me I have that when something scared me in a horror movie that's fair. That's really what sticks with me and resonates with me. Okay. So it's like kind of funny because for you, I feel like when you say resonates, it's almost inspired, or you saw something that stuck, that got that earworm, and just made you think on it. That was fascinating, yes. kind of thing. That like well, that's it, a good point of that is like three posters that I'm putting up um, that I'm about to acquire, mm-hmm. um, and a lot of people ask like, why are these movies um, the ones that you shine? They are not good, and they're not the best. But they're the ones where I was introduced to a point where I was like, I must see, I must know this. Yeah, you know, um, because they were they were the, I was the most aware when these movies and these franchises came out, and that's mm-hmm. um, Jason Takes Manhattan. Okay, yep. Because I lived in Jersey City, New Jersey, in '89, so '88, '89. So, and that's you can throw a stone yeah, to New York the City. So, exactly. like when they did all of the marketing for that it was very New York based and that was huge like you saw it you saw those commercials all the time I don't know if it was national I'm sure it was it was national marketing but like where I was you saw posters everywhere you of saw course because it it's big it's got a new Manhattan in the title so they're pushing hard yeah. on that yeah definitely um, then you have uh, Freddy's Dead the Final Nightmare okay see and I'm different on that one mine was a new nightmare so that was my That's first fair. one. Yep. So, so you are a little younger, younger though, so exactly, that makes sense. Yep. Because it's only a few years after. Right. And, but like, with Final, Freddy said Final Nightmare, I knew who these guys were. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's not the first movie I've seen, I, I saw in, right. in these. It was the first one where the marketing was out. I was at that right age of like eight it or nine. You. Yeah. And it just like, that's, I'm aware. Mm-hmm. Like, these are a thing. These are a big thing. And even like, Halloween, as much as it's my favorite, the one that made me the most aware in the poster I'll put up, with Halloween too, with Halloween, but I w- I'm going to put up with these three is Halloween 6. Oh. Curse of Michael Yeah, Myers. Curse. Yep. Because that was like the, I remember the marketing for that. I remember the old woman talking to the mm-hmm. little boy in the trailer and there's Michael Myers and it, and it was, and I remember that trailer more than I remember Paul Rudd being in the movie. That's yeah, fair. Totally you know, fair. Yeah. I always forget Paul Rudd was in this movie until I watch it. And I'm like, oh, that's right, Paul Rudd did play Tommy Doyle. How many times do I have to watch Breck and Meyer die in a video game for me to remember that's Breck and Meyer in a freaking Dream Warrior? You know, like that's. Oh, no, that's oh, sorry, Final Nightmare. Final, that's Final Nightmare, yes. Yep. So the Final Nightmare for me was also my Freddy Krueger one that I loved because of that scene. But to have seen uncut all the way through was New Nightmare. That was the one that I watched yeah, yeah. and was like into it. and was like, okay. Oh, Because I hadn't even seen the first. I hadn't seen First Friday uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. I didn't see the first Friday the 13th. The only horror movie I was introduced to was the first Halloween. Because that was my stepdad's favorite. Oh, yeah. And then my second one was Amityville Horror. And that was the most terrifying thing I'd ever seen in my life. And I was like 10. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Well, well, like, you know, like when you're a kid, especially in the 80s and these movies are coming out, like I said, like, Friday the 13th Part 8 wasn't the first one I saw. It just resonated with me because that was the marketing that was huge. Exactly. At the impressionable age that I was at. Mm -hmm. I think before then, like, it would come on TV and you watched what you could. Yeah, and whatever you just get what you can. Little scraps of horror that you can pull. And like 6 came on a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, 5 was on a lot. Seven was on sometimes. Child's Play 3 all the time. All the time. And I love that movie. I and don't I care. I love it. That and Pet Cemetery were on for, I swear, like a month straight back and forth between USA and TNT. Yeah. I could just flip back and forth. Dude, yeah, it's funny you mention that because like, if I went a step further and picking, like, oh, actually, we should do this at some point and, like, talk about, I guess, no time, like, present, like, which ones were the most impressionable for us. 
uh, Which Child's Play 3 would be maybe Child's Play 2 because it was so scary to see that doll and everybody had a, um, a My Buddy. Yeah. Back then. Yeah. And, you know, I had one. So, like, when you saw the trailer, like, but 3 was the one I was most aware of. Yeah, 3 was the one that was most omnipresent at all times. And especially whenever it talks, anyone talks about swapping bullets or shooting tracers or paint at each yeah. other, I'm like, no. How about no? I said, <laughs> absolutely not. Especially, oh, it looks like a real bullet? I get that. <laughs> I've seen what they do. Yeah, I know Chucky how this works. Me. Chucky changes them out. <laughs> oh, my God. They man. go to green rounds and everybody's live. <laughs> Dude, that was, that's so funny that you mentioned that, because cause then as you get older, like, the first one, like, Scream, of course, the first one oh, was yeah, that was, I think Scream was the one that, that first resonated with me as a horror movie from my generation that I could get into, followed immediately by I Know What You Did Last Summer. I agree. Uh, I'd take it in a little further, Not maybe not the first one that was impressionable. I'd say the first one that I felt like was made for me. Yeah. Everything else yeah, felt yeah, yeah. like... All those other franchises before felt like they were made for my brothers who yes. were older and things yes. like that. Well, that's one of the things you got to remember. What were you doing back then? Yeah. Like in those 70s and late eight, early 80s, late 70s, people were going to camps. Like it was a thing. Yeah. It was way more common that you got away. You did things outside of your comfort zone. You know, you would go to the city because that was a big trip. Mm-hmm. Now it's people go to the city for work. <laughs> it's, it's just Friday 13th, Jason on a boat. Mm-hmm. Forget that noise. Jason nope. takes a boat. Jason to, takes a boat <laughs> to Toronto or no Vancouver. <laughs> no, but then they, so the, with horror movies, that that's what always and uh, was like what resonated. And a lot of those were the movies that came out between eighty nine and like ninety three, ninety four. Yeah, I think it was that time where it was like preteen. It was like pre preteen and then preteen. They were like, ooh, these are things I'm not allowed to go see. Well, because at 9, 10, it's what you're not allowed to go see. It's all about breaking those rules and seeing something a little too much. And then by about 12, 13, it's, okay, now I saw a boob, so mm-hmm. I'm in. And then I just saw someone something really gory happen, and that was cool. Yep. You know, it was neat to see that. And then there would immediately be something terrifying, but you couldn't tell your friends about it. And then in your yes. teenage years, it was kind of like, okay, now you're growing. Now what is speaking to you because how would you get out of that situation with the killer? You start thinking mm-hmm. a little more beyond that, you know? So now you're old and you empathize with the killer. And like, <laughs> yeah, yes. Teenagers are annoying. There's a lot of times now, like watching the, uh, I watched Halloween 2018 again. Because I really do love that movie. I like what they that did well, a lot. So well, and I and, love that they're doing two more. I know, I'm stoked. It's going to be rad. Okay. Yeah, but uh, him go, killing the babysitter. The babysitter is one of my favorite scenes because mm-hmm. he kills that babysitter. First of all, she's wearing what they would have in the seventies. Like she's she's almost a perfect throwback character to murder. Yeah, it was really well done. And the little kid that she's babysitting is like, "Oh hell no, I'm out of here." Yeah, like, yeah, legit, go, go, get out of <laughs> you here, run. Um, you can't help. You're now. gonna die, Dave. You're gonna die. <laughs> but I think the thing that I loved about to kind of touch down with it um, on 2018 was it showed it was like this isn't about Lori. No. This wasn't about going after the ones who got you caught. He just wanted to kill. Yeah. He was going door to door. And just killing. Murdering yeah. people. And that babysitter just happened to be on that row. Yep. And that's why she died. And it wasn't so, like, he liked the fact that these girls were there and that he could kill them. Because I think that it would, that's his prey. That's well, what and he that's, wants. Because remember, he leaves the baby. Yes, he does leave a baby because that's not what he's looking to kill. Because there's no fear in that for him. There's no rush in that. But him, I mean, he walks into one lady's house, smashes her head and grabs a knife. Walks into the next lady's house, smashes her face and stabs her in the throat. Is literally walking to on the street and sees a girl by herself at the car. The kid runs back inside and he starts walking towards her. The moment the kid runs out, then he's like, oh, found my keys. And they get in the car and he just stops, turns, and goes back into another house. Yep. That's just what he does. He's just That's, killing. He doesn't care. Like when Lori runs into him for the first time, and it's just like, Michael, and like she's been obsessed for all these years. Exactly. And he just like rolls out. Mm-hmm. He's like, okay, I don't need the heat. I'm mm-hmm. going to kill. That's what I want to do. Yep. And I, I love that. I thought that was perfect. After all these years, and having all of these movies that are like, Jamie's the obsession. Not Lori mm-hmm. Lori is the obsession. Well, she's my obsession. She's not. She's, she's, she's <laughs> so beautiful. But, um, she is the obsession mm-hmm. 
Um, and then, like, and even... So it's almost like all those movies were in her head. Like, yeah, I am the obsession. I am what he wants. This is what he would do. He, he wants me. Mm -hmm. And then to turn around and be like, yeah, he doesn't care about you. But then he has to care about you when he gets brought to the house. Right. But it's because you're ju he's just a force, and you're in his way. He's the shape. He wants As to kill I, you. I love when you actually realize that he is just the shape. He is nothing else but the pure embodiment of massive movement, evil, and murder. The way it's Carpenter it. meant it. Exactly. And it was done perfectly. And I love the new Loomis guy who's losing his mind, like, we must study the evil. And I must get inside of him and understand the joy of killing. And it's, he was perfect. He was absolutely perfect. I was like, thank you for giving me a mad scientist. I'm great with having a mad scientist in a John Carpenter film. It's wonderful. Dude, I want... I, I can't wait to see what they're going to do with the next two. And... It's actually funny that we're getting into the horror because we did both watch a new movie this weekend. Yes, we did. It's very, we were very fortunate to see, um, which is Three from Hell. Three from Hell. So, speaking of things that resonate with us and stick with us, there's one thing that, you know, we kind of bring back into that whole idea that for you it's what it's inspiring, for me it's more what's frightening. And that's mm -hmm. what really sticks with us. That's what gives us that. This movie, unfortunately for me, it stayed in its lane. It did exactly what I thought it was going to do, and it was a solid film for, for a Rob Zombie film. So my overall take on it is I think it was exactly what it set out to be, mm -hmm. and I think it did it well, and I was totally good with Clint Howard dying. Uh -huh. <laughs> like, that's no, it's the ice cream man. Isn't it? He's got to die. <laughs> don't uh -huh. bring up the ice cream man again. That movie that's is the worst thing that's ever been put on film. Oh, my God. Next to Killer Clowns in Space. <laughs> oh, no, Killer Clowns is awesome. <laughs> I love Killer Clowns. It's so goofy. Um, it's beautifully goofy. Which is um, why I want to watch the Banana Splits. I think more than I wanted to see... Too. Yeah, more than I wanted to see Three from Hell, but this, that was the homework assignment, so I was like, well, I'm going to watch this. Watch Three... We're going to watch the Banana Splits we'll talk about next week, because yep, I want to get your feelings on it. Um, but Three from Hell, it's the second, in my opinion... It's the second best Rob Zombie movie. Okay. I mean, that's pretty solid. What are you putting in front that's of it? That's not pretty solid. <laughs> what do you put in front of it? Devil's Rejects. Okay, so you still His put Devil's movie. number one. Yeah, I agree. His best movie. His best written movie. Yes. His, in my opinion, as much as I, I love Rob Zombie, great musician, and he visually is a beautiful director. I was going to say, as a director... I really enjoy what he puts on film. Not just visually, but he pulls out some really cool performances mm -hmm. from his actors. I agree. And he surrounds himself with some really cool actors. Like, But he can't write a movie. I'm sorry he cannot write a movie. He has great ideas, but I think if he aligned himself with somebody who can write the way he likes, the way he wants... And like, I'm not saying don't be in the writer's room, let him do his own mm -hmm. thing. Of course. I'm saying... Give them the treatment, tell them this what you want, and then like let them write it though. Let them form the story and really try and make it interesting. You would he would be a tour de force in filmmaking. But it, he can't get out of his own way. Yeah, that's very true. And I, I have to always go back to his Halloween because I didn't mind the first one. That's his third best movie. I I, I liked to say I liked the first one almost makes me feel like I have to poop on the original one. Because there's such a divergence, but there isn't. You know, it's like it's 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 good. The second one is what kind of ruins it. Oh, it ruins his direction with it because it was just it didn't go anywhere near where it should have. It didn't try to pretend to pay homage to Carpenter. It didn't do anything. It just went right off the rails. Yeah. The first one I loved because it had three great scenes, and that tension build up with him coming through the walls as she's hiding in the walls was one of my favorite scenes they did. And that's Rob Zombie's directing. That had nothing to do with writing, had nothing to do with that. Now, to get there, yeah. unfortunately, you have to, you have to, you know, use a little uh, stretches. You have to... Yeah, like, I, that's the thing, like, when you talk about Tar uh, Tarantino, mm -hmm. Tarantino is a once-in-a-generation filmmaker. Agreed. He is, he can do no wrong, especially when people... And rest in peace, Robert Forrester, one of my favorite actors of all time. We've talked oh, about yeah, that in a little man. while, but I just want to shine like his weakest film is probably Jackie Brown. Okay. And I dare you, anybody listening, go back and rewatch that and think 
this is a genius movie. It was just coming off the coattails of Pulp Fiction. Mm -hmm. And that's why it didn't do as well. I think if it was before Pulp Fiction, it would have been better. It would have been received. I think it was better. perfect the way it is. I think that it was the M. Night Shyamalan effect of like, you made this huge movie, mm -hmm. and that's what you are now. Right. But he broke that. Yes. Which I give it to him. He, Tarantino is genius enough to break it. Um, now, I'm not in any way, shape, or form saying, I, like I said, putting down Jackie Brown. I think Jackie Brown is one of his strongest movies. Uh, and it's hard because he's made nine, and they're all brilliant. Yeah. Um, I can't look at one and say it's 100% unequivocally better than the other. I cannot do that. And then I still haven't seen Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, so I still, it's because God, I haven't seen it. That might be my favorite. See, that's everybody's been saying. They've been coming out talking about that. You especially with the old-timey Hollywood and how that's it really thing. ties into a that's lot of stuff, jam. you know. It ties into that perfect realm, yeah. you know, so it's fitting. I get it. And I love that all of these characters, Luke Perry, Timothy Oliphant, all of them, are playing real actors that were in real westerns that really right. existed. Um, even like the Rick Dalton character of Leonardo DiCaprio, his FBI episode was the FBI episode that Burt Reynolds was in. Oh, wow. And he's playing the part Burt Reynolds did. <laughs> so like, they play, but his universe, it works. It's, it's just perfect. It's and, his universe, and it's a fun, twisted universe. One that Hateful Eight does exist in. One that, you know, everything can fit in. And Glorious Bastards, of course that's just the world we live in and okay. came out of, you know. Truly a genius. Truly, and the reason I didn't bring it back, and I want to bring it back to Three from Hell, is that Rob Zombie has created this world too, this universe of these movies, and you know, there's the, they don't all connect, but the Firefly universe is a big one, and they all sort of you can see all of his movies living in the same world, mm -hmm. not just those three. Like Thirty One, you could see this being something. Lords of Salem, you could see all of this stuff existing in one shared universe. Absolutely. And I think he does a great job building that. And like I said, his movies look great. They're well acted and he pulls out great performances. He's got cool dialogue. It all works. Mm -hmm. It's the story. It's just the story that doesn't work for me. Three from Hell was a fun movie. Yeah. Um, we get an almost way of the gun-like scene. I mean, I'm always yeah. a fan of that, and I love that movie. So anytime oh, you tie in a way of the gun, even slightly, it's like, yeah, you're going to have a, a shootout in this place, like basically a Mexican hotel, yeah. <laughs> for starting in the center. Okay, yeah, let's do this. Oh, it was perfect. <laughs> all of them, ooh, all of them, the lucha masks, like all the gangsters yeah. or something. Like it was, it was cool. It was very cool, stylistic. But I can't complain about that. Everything. House of Thousand Corpses looks oh, yeah. oh, fucking <laughs> bad. Like <laughs> not bad, not bad. I meant to say I'm trying not to curse, so like now saying badass, but I don't think that's a curse. No I badass words. Bad. Yeah. So like if it can if it can get by a network, ass. let's do that. If it gets by the network, we can do it. <laughs> that's fair. But um, I just. But the story is like all right. It's just like you're just trying to show a bunch of horrible stuff, like. And you have all these cool characters, but it's like, yeah. And the Firefly universe for me is is understandable and it fits because it's very much so that natural born killers, that Tarantino esque killer style. Yeah. Someone that Tarantino would have written. I feel like these are characters who could be written in that style of universe. Yeah. Rob Zombie has taken it and made it his own, and I'm very happy and comfortable with his universe. I'm cool inside of it. Like I get the idea inside of it. Uh, they did a great job once again promoting and maintaining the Firefly family and doing a good job of pressing them forward. But overall, it's just once I watch it a couple times, it's not a universe I need to revisit. And, and I, I think know. that's where the weakness comes for me is rewatchability for me is not there. It's yeah. a it's a I will watch that I will watch three Tarantino movies to every one of these movies yeah. annually. You know, it's just the way it is for me. It's not that I'm not that roped into it. And I'll need to watch this at least two more times to fully absorb it all and decide exactly if I like it or hate it. But yeah. thus far, it just it's the same thing that Devil's Rejects was for me. Everyone loved that movie. And I respected that movie. I didn't like it until a year after it came out. Like, it took me a whole year and almost three full viewings to be like, oh, no, I do like this movie. Okay. Yeah. Like, I get it. Like, and it's that's, just, that's what I think it is. Like, And I've seen a couple of them now to try and get... To, to put it over, like, I, you know, I was never going to watch Lord of Salem because I don't really care about witches. Right. That's just not my jam. But what turned me on that was um, season three of 
American Horror Story. Oh God, and, so good. And Coven is my favorite. Still my it's favorite. Still I, I don't like witches, and that's my favorite. Mm-hmm. And I still think that's great. I'm taking 1984 now, just for the silliness. But yeah, I haven't watched it. I haven't started it yet. I'm I'm actually still back on Hotel, but I might. That's fair. (laughs) I mean, but the nice part is you can skip all around. Yeah, exactly. um, But when it comes to uh, Rob Zombie's uh, movies, like I went and watched Lord of Salem, and I'm like, it's just not a good movie. It's a cool concept, right? Uh, It's got cool characters. It's got a cool vibe. It's got good performances. But I don't take it. Like, I'm just like, the, but the story isn't intriguing to me. I'm like, why? Am, I'm just tired. Why? I don't care. That's my thing is it's not enough to grab me in. I have to wonder, what are we waiting for? What's the next move? And you're kind of moving along with that. Mm-hmm. So this one, very much so, when they're sitting in the hotel figuring out what's the next thing to do, I was legitimately sitting there going, do I want to finish watching this? And then yeah. when they came up with Mexico, I was like... I mean, yeah, we'll but see like, what it's going to do. How is that not, A, your first How did you know choice? you had that plan? Why, like, like, why did your loose cannon have to go and kill a dude? Right. And then you're just like, okay, we got to go. Yeah, like, it's just... Yeah. And it's, for me, it's... I'm like, I don't know. Yeah, like it's just that's the story points that I'm just kind of like, come on, you do so much better. If you just had a writer there with you, taking everything that you said and making a good through-line story through it, you know, I'm going to get you from A to B. Okay. It's going to make sense, but we're going to add your beats. Mm-hmm. You know, it, as long as you're willing to give up some things that don't work. And, yeah, and that's, I think, a big problem is is the change in those characters that would require that is too much at this point to change that universe if this is your focus. Yeah. Those three, that's what they are. That's what you're going to get. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. So it's logically the next progression. I see it. I get it. And I understand people who love this series. I get people who love Rob Zombie. I totally understand it. And I get people who love these movies and Lord of Salem. And, you know, they, they like Rob Zombie's Halloween. Yep. Okay, totally fair. I get it. It's just not my cup of tea. When you exactly, get to the end yeah. of the day, everything to me averages out to a six. But I There's, you know, out of ten, I just, all of his movies average out to six by the end of it. Yeah. And I just go, okay. But I like how you said average. Like, for me, I think it's about a five, because there are some that are just like, I don't know. Like, There's enough great gore scenes that I can go with it. But I'm a Hellraiser guy, so you know that works for me. So I'm cool again, like, I don't mind the gore if it makes sense. And, like, his movies, the gore makes sense. Absolutely. So I'm cool yeah. with it. Like, Hellraiser, it makes sense. Yeah. That's why I will watch it. But I just, I think that Hellraiser is the type of movie that if you've seen it once or twice in your life, if you're not a hardened, true, like, Hellraiser is my franchise I need to watch it but if you're a horror fan if you've seen it once or twice you're good that is fair you know what as a horror fan I 100% agree with you as a Clive Barker fan that's where I come in with like the heavy part because I love Nightbreed Nightbreed is like one of my all time favorite movies and I tell no one about that except here on this podcast because no one can judge me through a computer so (laughs) they can judge me through a computer technology Manitou is going to bite you back um but that's, that's, I love Clyde Barker, so of course, I have a skew, the same way people who love Rob Zombie have a skew. Oh, yeah. And that's why I get it. I totally will not put it down, because believe me, I tried to watch some other Hellraiser movies. They suck. Yeah. They're not good. They're just, like, no, you, like you say, they're gore porn. And that's what they are, and I'm not a fan of that. I don't like it. I don't need to see sludgy, sloopy, sloppy, bleh, you know, that's what they want to show you. Fluids. It's not yeah, good. Yeah, like, it's not for me, but yeah. But like you know, like you're saying with Rob Zombie, like, yeah, I get there's hard fans, but they have to accept the fact that like the stories just aren't that good. Yeah. Like but you can still like the movie. Like I said, I'll still watch certain movies. You know, Halloween, his Halloween is on T V, I'll leave it on. Of course. Not that piece we'll of garbage out. No, on two. Halloween two. No. But Halloween one, I will watch it. I'll leave it on. I'm like, it's it's not a bad movie. It's not. And that actually probably has the best story out of all of them because he took it from, which is funny because he took it from uh, Carpenter. Yeah, yeah. And all he did was revisit. I didn't need a backstory for Michael Myers. I like the fact that, but in his universe, this Michael Myers has a backstory. This is who he was and a cool scene. And at the same token, I could see the Firefly family in this Michael Myers universe. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. So Rob Zombie still has his finger put properly, the way Tarantino does, the way Clive Barker, Stephen King, everybody has their worlds, yes. and I dig that, and that's why I am happy about Three from Hell, and I would recommend anyone who has seen Thirty One and Devil's Rejects, House of a Thousand Corpses, go watch it. 
Of course it's worth yeah, it. Yeah, I, I, it say, does get a review for me to go see it. Yes. Especially if you're a fan. Yes. But it's just, it, it's more just barking that, like, yeah, it's just another movie he made that didn't have a great story. Right. But it's still cool. Like yeah. I said, it's still, like, filmmakers can learn by watching, yeah, watch, yeah. watching Rob Zombie and how he does things. Um, His shootouts are phenomenal. His oh, yeah. shootouts are so good because he does that abrupt, up-close shootout. And I like that because to me it's a little more realistic. You yeah. know, it's that little more of, oh crap, it's in your face right now, trigger's pulled. You know, this mm-hmm. is how it is. It is terrifying and fast and rapid. And yeah. it's cool. I dig that. I just wish you'd stop going back to this pool. You and, ended it yeah. really nicely. Like, you did it again and it was a hit. Yeah. <laughs> and you went back and you're like, there's more I want to tell about the these characters yes and that's great but it didn't like it worked that time I wish you didn't go first of all because of Sid Haig rest in peace mm-hmm. just passed away R.I.P. fantastic were huge fan fantastic uh, man Robert Forster and Sid Haig these are all man, these are some these are monumental actors in the cult world yeah and and they're both gone and Dude, Robert long. Forster was fantastic I saw him again was like oh my gosh I used to love his voice he had one of those voices he tried to use and do the impression of oh my god he was, he was great he great but he had a deeper temper than that sorry <laughs> he uh, uh no I want to get to him but I want to finish, yes. I want to, I want to finish okay we'll album. wrap up zombie here yeah my, my well just for me to wrap up on my end mm-hmm. I just want to say I think people should see it again Going to see a Rob Zombie movie, especially if you're a filmmaker, you're going to get a master class on how to make a movie look. And it's always a good experience. He does a good experience. He gives yeah. you a good movie-going experience. It is worth it. You never feel like you wasted your money. Yeah. I haven't, personally. You know, I've, oh, I've done much. Halloween 2 was a, I don't know, kerfuffle of mistakes, really. It's, yeah. I can't put all that on him. but I. No, I don't, I don't put it all on him. But I do say that I wish he would team up with a writer he really likes, a really well-adjusted writer yeah. that he likes, and I wish they would just team up and knock it out of the park every time, because he can do it. I know yeah. he can do it. He's that he's that good of a filmmaker. You can't be that good of a filmmaker in all areas, and like, yeah, you're going to suffer in one, and it's the writing, and so just team up with somebody who is a well-crafted writer who will just get you from point A to point B with your ideas. Mm-hmm. And I, there, there are people out there you can do that with, and I just wish you would do that. And that, with that being said, I did not... The only thing with Three from Hell was, you could have told this story with new characters and had those same three actors playing those new characters. Yeah. I don't think you need to go back to the pool for it. That's fair. Um, I'm going to agree to disagree with you on that. I'm happy they went back to the pool. I think it was a good way to give a final little wrap-up to everybody. It timed well to give a nod to Sid Haig, even though we didn't know we were going to need it or want it, and then we got it and went, oh, wow. That was important. That was really big that he got to do that. You know, his little 15, 20 minutes was fantastic. I love oh, it. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's I mean, beautiful. Really, yeah, really, really fantastic. And then they even get back into it, like Baby and Otis at one point have a talk. Yeah. And they bring that up, and that was a beautiful scene. So, overall, I say definitely worth a view. Rob Zombie is good as much as you like Rob Zombie. That's so. Uh, it's that is how you will gauge and rate this movie. Once again, I give it a six. Yeah, I'm gonna stick with. Nah, I mean, I'll go up for a six for this because there was some really cool stylistic stuff I liked about it. And, um, but I will say this: you are the commander in geek, so that makes perfect sense. But I am the scene snob, so I will say this. That ending of Devil's Rejects is too beautiful <laughs> to make another movie with these characters. Well, look, as the commander and geek, I only supersede because it gave us up to this third movie. But as a scene snob, I 100% agree that ending to Devil's Rejects never should have been touched. Yeah. I can absolutely 100% agree with that because Devil's Rejects was an 8 to a 9. And because of this movie coming out, it drops at almost half a point. Just because they survived that hail of bullets. It's like, come on. Can I just say that? Come on. Poor Psychorama. Why? We segued so hard and just kept going. <laughs> like it was like, yeah, yeah, we'll get to Frank and Hooker later. But long story short, there I I, I bowed out early. Oh, did you? I was so tired. Okay, so did you? So really hard. did you finish Frank and Hooker, or did no. you finish? Yeah, you, you finished in Frank and Hooker. I fin- that was my last. Yeah. Okay, was it good? Frank and Hooker? Yeah, ridiculous. And ridiculous. As it sounds like it should yeah. be cool. Um, but then I could I didn't stay for the secret film. Uh, which I knew what it was, and I've seen it a ton of times. Uh, and then House was the last movie. Oh, yeah. Which, 
Yeah. I mean, it, it's a good movie, and it's a good, it's a solid ending, I think. Oh yeah, for um, your Monster Mash, I agree. I wish House I stayed is, the whole time. House is one of my favorites, but House Two to supersedes once again. The fear factor in House Two got me way more than House One. It's okay. so weird that House Two scared you. Oh my god, it's so weird. Because me. when I obviously watching it as I'm older now, I'm like House Two is awful. Like it's just so disjointed. There's so much ridiculousness really? to it, and. House 1 is really good at being disjointed and ridiculous, but I feel like House 2 goes a little further. <laughs> and they just stretch the reality a little bit more. I mean, when you can break through the wall of your tub <laughs> and wind up somewhere... Well, when you break through the wall of your tub and wind up somewhere doing a... in what, a, a sacrifice? <laughs> There's a mind sacrifice going on? Come on, man. That's what makes it. And I, also, let's not forget in House 2, we have the... I lived in a house where the foot of my bed was at the basement, or at the attic door. Really? Yes. That's hard, huh? The bed. My foot. Was and there a door, though? Three feet. A door. Okay, so there's a door at least. Oh, it yeah. Like, oh, no. It wasn't God. like there's the door off the hinges no, and there's God. stairs to the But the, that is, there's, you open it up and there's just a little, looks like a wall. Paint it's the just picture a tiny closet. Paint the picture. So you open that door and there's about three feet forward and that's all unfinished wood Ooh, and that goes into unfinished stuff. steps directly to your right that Mike you wouldn't be able to fit on was it servants quarters yes uh, might as well have been it was tiny oh farmhouse but I mean, they yeah that. farmhouse man no not quite like that but a servant yeah. quiet, a servant style I mean it was just kind of that tiny access where you no, could basically when I say that no I don't because like there were farmhouses oh yeah no it wasn't had like that. servants quarters no, no 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 this one was just a straight attic just an unfinished attic. Oh, okay. So, but unfinished attic that has the creepy, you know, you have the pallets of uh, plywood, and then you can only walk out so far before it's, you could potentially fall right to your death. Not really your death, but fall into the, through the roof, through okay. the ceiling, rather. So, yeah, terrifying place, <laughs> especially when you're younger. Welcome to Connecticut. Yeah, I mean, everything, everything is haunted. Everything. Yeah, everything is haunted. I mean, there was a couple places right down the street that were all haunted. This <laughs> is terrifying. A lot of murders there. Lots of murders there. Because there's not much to do in old CT. Maybe so, that's why you're so afraid of horror movies, and I'm not so much. Right. Because I grew up in the ghetto. Yeah. And you grew up in, like, Hauntedville, USA. Literally, where everything is haunted. <laughs> because everything has a story, and no one ever goes back to it. Most of these houses that had the haunted story remained abandoned. That's the thing. <laughs> you have to yeah. remember, when we walked up to these places, there was a story about them. No one had moved in to take care of them. There were families that either died or families that were like, we want nothing to do with those people, and they just left. Dude. I mean, Connecticut has a bunch of schools, jails, amusement theme parks that are all just abandoned. Everything in Connecticut gets abandoned. Oh. It's horrifying. <laughs> That's so crazy. It's really creepy, man. And there's farms, and there's always weird lights in the sky. <laughs> and that was right next to a waterfalls and a bridge and a dam, so who knew what was happening? Not to mention, it was like Jersey, and that every warehouse-like place we had, there at least one window was out. So, <laughs> there, like isn't broken. Only, there isn't only one window in Jersey. They're all out. Yeah, exactly. They're still like you work in them. <laughs> it's, it's, you, every Bruce Springsteen song paints the perfect picture of what New Jersey looks like for me. Right. And it was just like, okay, like this is real. The scrap metal yards. Right next to the freaking right next to the the, <laughs> the um, strip clubs. Strip clubs. <laughs> oh my god! Was, that one's not even a strip club. That one's a go-go bar. Yeah, that was a go-go bar. You were saying, which is even better because I want to go see a go-go bar. That would be fascinating to me. No, you don't. Yeah, yes, I do. Yeah, it is so weird. I remember the first time I ever went into a go-go bar. This is a geek podcast, or whatever. Yeah. Uh, first time I went over to, I was a geek. Yes. See, and I turned like it. eighteen or something. You could go in at that point. And you just sit there, and it's they're dancing in like bathing suits, right? And they're just like, "Hey, baby, you you want to put your dollar here?" And I'm just like, "No, I just it feels weird." It does. I was like, <laughs> I don't look at my friend. I'm like, "We gotta go." I, I would like, immediately be like, "Well, like the first time I went, like, well, what do I get?" Well, that's, <laughs> that's what I mean. I'm like. Like, are you going to get me a drink? Like, yeah. what's going on? Are you a bar? Because you're, you're sitting at the bar, and that's what they're dancing. Oh, okay. Somewhere on the stage and right, such. Right. But for the most part, like, if you're at a strip club and they're naked, 
You're just kind of like, I know where I am. Yeah, you know exactly what you're there for. When yeah. you give a dollar, it's because you have a show. Yeah, th- this is like, yeah, it's a show, but it's like, it's like the bar mitzvah. If strip, cl- if strip clubs are like the weddings, I'm using a terrible metaphor here. <laughs> no, but this is great. Go with it. I got yeah, I'm going to roll. So, if strip clubs are like a wedding event yes. level, then trust me. I'm talking like the high end strip. Oh clubs. yeah, yeah. You because know, like, sometimes end. you get some, you know, back of the barn weddings, mm-hmm. and that's fine. But like, ain't nothing like a couple double wides together. The old foxy go. lady. There you go. Like then, then. <laughs> such a bad analogy. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm just waiting to see how the it goes. Go-go bars are like the Sweet Sixteen. Oh my God, it's such a bad analogy. Don't, I don't, don't want to know. Don't, I don't can't finish do it. Sweet nope. nope. Can, can't see it. No. Nope. A graduation nope. party. Eh. Would that make it less like like a high school graduation party? Right. Like that? Would that make it less weird? I don't, I don't know at this point. It's so I'm not weird. Sure. I want to get off of this topic. Yeah. Uh, we're doing a Mike Kimmel segue. So, uh, here no, we go. No, so if gonna... that was like the triple A. <laughs> oh, no, I don't the even want to. The single A. No, I don't even want to keep going. All right, fair enough. And in earlier news. <laughs> All I'm saying is there's scrap yards next to the go-go bars in Jersey. That's fair. And I am still excited to go check them out. Oh because there's nothing better than walking in and laughing. Yes. It is the best medicine to sometimes just go in and go, well, I'm not here. Yeah, that's fair. I will say Not this. putting down the money that anyone makes doing whatever the heck they have to or want to do. No, you go exactly. and have fun doing it. Just not my cup of tea. No, 100% agree. Thank you doing, for doing it for me. <laughs> I will say this, though. New trailers came out this week. Yes. We had. Well, we got Dr. Doolittle today. So, so I, I yes, I saw but did not watch the trailer. Like, I just saw the headline with Dr. Doolittle with Robert Downey Jr., really. It's. I, I wonder if he is... Um, is he going Eddie Murphy route? Well, if he's like a Victorian era, like Darwin lover, like because like you had Sherlock, you have this, mm-hmm. and it's like it's very similar in vein. Like where Sherlock is more actiony because he's a you know he's outside with, but this is action. This like, seems pretty actiony, yeah. Pirates in it, and it, but it just seems very similar. And I feel like every movie he goes to after. You know, when he's not doing Iron Man, he's playing uh, something Victorian era, which it is has cool. Been. He can do it. He pulls it off. It has been a lot. I mean, there was the one movie he did with Jamie Foxx uh, that I was a big fan of. One of the few that he has done of a common, normal time. Yep. Uh, what was what was the name of that? The one where he plays the Jamie Foxx is a famous cellist who loses his mind and like beats uh, the crap out of what him. What is that called? Oh my god! Uh, Anywho, that's the yeah. that's one of the movies that I'm a big fan of 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 his that was outside of that realm. But beside that, all I watch with Robert Downey Jr. is basically either him when he was coked out or Iron Man. It's about it. I mean, Sherlock Holmes floats in every once in a while, but I I'm still such a Sherlock BBC fan. That it's still worth it. Go I mean, oh no, it is. Watch oh, it absolutely is. I, Game of Shadows is fantastic, and I love <laughs> his ending with Moriarty. I mean, he's great. 100%. He's it's fantastic. I just love the other Sherlock too, and I love that uh, Martin Freeman as much as Jude Law. Like they all balance out for me. Well, like okay, so Doolittle basically like doesn't give you too much. You know, yeah. he talks to animals, right? You know, so you can you can he's kind of quirky for that. Season. It looked and felt like a Rudyard Kipling adventure. Yes, <laughs> yes, that's, that works. Yeah. That works. That's like good Swiss Family character. Doolittle, <laughs> and it's yeah, and it seems like they just have to go on this task, and who knows what it's for? They don't really tell you, um, but yeah, that's a solid comparison. I like that. Um, I will say, uh, Jungle Cruise looks kind of cool. Okay, Jungle Cruise. That's the one with The Rock and Emily Blunt. Oh, yeah, yeah, Based on Jungle Cruise ride in Disney. Yes. And it's very African Queen-ish. Um, I don't know. I'm not 100% sure where it takes place. It might take place in the Amazon or whatever. But she, And it's very, it's like the mummy, mm-hmm. almost. Yep. Like, in the same vein as, like, you know, she is this uh, kind of snooty, almost. Snobbish, if you will. <laughs> Bit of a snob. Not a scene snob, but a snob. Nope, just a um, snob. Just a standard old snob. Yeah, she's like an Indiana Jones type, but like, not if Indiana Jones didn't fight or... Less adventure But No, as adventure Ah. 
No, let's just stick with the mummy. It's basically like that. Yeah. Rachel Weiss's character. Rachel Weiss's character. You know, where she kind of gets into things, but it's like because she's trying to procure stuff or whatever. Yeah. And then she has to go up the, I'm guessing, the Amazon River. Um, it seemed right. Again, I'm not sure if this takes place in Africa or it takes place in um, South America. I should look that up. But yeah, it's more fun he's to guess. a gimmick guy. He runs a boat tour. And this is back in the day. This is Victorian era. Mm-hmm. So he, uh, The Rock runs a boat tour. The Jungle Cruise, where all the stuff that's in the ride, he's doing, he's setting it up. Awesome, okay. You know, and the uh, Huckster kind of deal. Giving right, everybody right. like this adventurous ride mm-hmm. that's still kind of broken down. Mm-hmm. And then she hires him to take her up wherever she needs to go, and they get into this adventure. And he's an adventurous dude. You can't hide the rock. <laughs> you can't hide. You can't hide the rock behind being like. Well, he's not that adventurous. Like, well, they hide they hid yes, him perfectly in Race to Witch Mountain. <laughs> they did not. <laughs> in any way, shape, or form. No, he's straight up 100% an adventurer in that movie. Um, I will say... I did like him in Jumanji, and I'm super excited we get a Jumanji 2. Don't even care that it's the same trope. I'm all about it. They want to go with it. They, oh, can, they can roll with that forever. Yes, I'm in. Yes, they, they built such a cool universe. Yep. That I really dig, and I got everybody back for it. Um, and if we have the idea of The Rock as a, let's, let's, he's probably, if anything in this movie, from my very limited knowledge of it, and the fact that I've seen almost nothing of it, I'm definitely going to create something out of completely left field, and say he's a little bit of Bogart from African Queen. That's what I mean, yeah, he's dressed just like him. probably a little bit of... John Voight from Anaconda. No, I didn't get that vibe. No? I didn't not, get that not, vibe. not feeling that? Because that's exactly what I'm guessing it's going to be. <laughs> no, <laughs> John Voight was such a bad character. He was an amazing character. He was God. the best with that horrible accent. With that, uh, I mean, you couldn't even tell if they didn't were trying to dye his skin or not. Like, was that... Was he <laughs> Cajun in it? Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. Oh, like, God. Cajun and Portuguese and Brazilian? He was a couple things. I don't think he knew what he was. I don't think he was just like, all right, I'll use this dialect. Please, nondescript. (laughs) Oh, my God. That's such a... Yeah. No, that movie I actually absolutely despise. With not famous Owen Wilson in it? (laughs) Not famous J-Lo. She got pretty famous. Though. I mean, unfortunately, that was one of her big... Ice Cube. Yes, that is fair. That was her one of her big ones. That was one of her big ones. That Uh, that was John Voight's... I mean, that was John Voight's height, too. John Voight had just come off doing, or was getting ready to do the FDR. He had just done, I think, FDR for Pearl Harbor, which I loved. Did he? No, that was before Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor was 2000, 99, 2000. Oh, yeah, I guess Anaconda was 96. Yeah, that was J-Lo. Was still this was before Out of Sight. Yeah, yeah, Out of yeah, Sight was yes, like the one that, that really, the one. like... Yeah, because the, of the Clooney, of course. Any Clooney vehicle she at that point. That yeah. Oh, she, she no, she's great in it. Clooney uh-huh. gave, the, gave her the push, though. Yeah. And Clooney's a buzz... But yeah, she uh, that was J Lo's original face, I think, in Anaconda too, like all original body parts. So that was way a long time ago. Selena's what really propelled her to it's a it. known name. Yeah, well, that was right post Fly Girls. So yeah, yeah. And then uh, I think Anaconda was like, okay, you can be blockbusters. Yeah. You know, like we can push you towards mm-hmm. that. And then, but Out of Sight's what did it for her. Yeah, Out of Sight was. Like, was I remember Out of Sight all over like Entertainment Tonight, <laughs> Access Hollywood. <laughs> Uh, another trailer that came out was uh, Charlie's Angels. Yes, Charlie's Angels. It I looks like another Charlie's Angels movie. Thank you for saying that, <laughs> because that is how I feel. I am not interested or invested in this at all. I wasn't really interested or invested in the other Charlie's Angels. And it has nothing to do with women in power or anything not like all. that. No. It just, I just don't care. No, my sister loved, loves the Charlie's Angels movies. And go More power to her. I yeah. have no concern. I don't care. It's not a big deal. But it doesn't mean I put them down. It's one of those other movies where I just go, okay, cool. Yeah. It's a, it's the same thing with Rob Zombie movies. Alright, cool. I know what it's going to be. I know it's, it's going to be fair. fine. It'll be entertaining. And if I choose I to watch it, I'm not going to claw my eyes out. But it's not something I'm rushing to see. That's where you and I disagree. I don't think they're entertaining at all. Like they Really? Just, no, they were not. Like, really? I just... The other Charlie's Angels movies? Yeah, oh. Full Throttle made me chuckle. I mean, there were scenes in it. You're kind yeah. of like, all right, whatever. But I have a thing against Drew Barrymore anyway. 
I've just yeah, never been weird. a big fan you're of hers. Right. I've not, I mean, she, she's all right. And she's getting better and better as she gets older. I am, she's all right. I'm just happy she didn't mess up Fever Pitch. They all seem misplaced. <laughs> they, well, that's the thing, is they do. Charlize, uh, not, wow, whoa, went way off the reservation there. Wait, Let's oh. have everyone calm down. Cameron Diaz is the only one to me who fits the role. And she's the one that they made. At the, that time, yeah. And she's the one I feel like they made goofier than need to be. Uh, yeah, but I think I think I think this movie what bothers me the most is, and just to uh, I get it, another guy commenting on female driven <laughs> action movies, but um, like you have this certain type. That's why Captain Marvel didn't work for me, is because it, it's like this. It's like it's like that hokey action movie that just didn't work for me. It wasn't even that comic booky for me. It was just like, it's trying too hard to be something that the 90s had with their female-driven action movies. And don't get me wrong, I can go on and on and on about male-driven action movies. Oh, of course. Um, but this, just in tune with the yeah, new just movie with coming out, Charlie, yeah, it Charlie's seems like Angels. this new Charlie's Angels is the same way. But then you have movies like Atomic Blonde, which is phenomenal. You know, or That's one of like the that. coolest movies with the Russian spin and that whole and 80s like, era of like Russian spy games and everything. God, I love that stuff. It was, it's awesome. It's and amazing. Even Red Sparrow. I thought Red Sparrow was great. And even like everything I'm hearing about Black Widow. Oh, yes. Like here you go, yeah. a female driven Marvel action movie, yep. and it's going to be legit. Yeah. I mean, I look, I personally love Captain Marvel. I think it fit really well, played well, and it just it plugged where it needed to plug well, and it was it, we got to see Nick Fury kind of be fun. So I think it did a lot of things. But then I take that, and I take the Captain Marvel, and I'm like, it reminds me of the whole Charlie's Angels movies. It mm -hmm. reminds me of this new one coming out. It reminds me of those types of movies. They're shoving and it a little And then you have Wonder out. Woman, which is like a, was on a, a complete different level within itself. You know me, I. I love DC mm -hmm. comics, Absolutely. but I gave up on the movies. Yeah, of course, you know, Why wouldn't you? I watch Dawn them when they Dawn come out. Justice is just I'll rent out. them or you know whatever when they come out, uh, or when they come out on HBO or whatever. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't, I don't care. But Wonder Woman, I'll be there for the second one. Yep, because that first one was so good. It was, and it was a perfect. It was a perfect action movie let alone female-driven action movie. Like, it was a perfect action movie. It was a great action movie. We got a great backstory of a DC character we all know and love. We got a, a character, of a, a lead actress who can play it perfectly, who was able to play that Diana very well. And that, that young Diana, we get to see kind of fall into our world, yeah. which is exciting, and that's what we want to see, that fish-out-of-water story, Absolutely. but with someone who can demolish everything in her path, which is great. But it makes sense, like... But then you go back and you look at it and you're like, okay, but that movie made sense. That movie, that movie didn't try to say this is Wonder Woman. This is a comic book movie. This is a movie for girls. That movie just said, we're an action movie. Yep. We're a comic book movie. And we're taking it seriously. It comfortably it wore many hats. Seriously. It comfortably wore many hats, which for me, Aquaman did too. Oh my God! No, Don't no, even get me started. no, I will fight you on Aquaman. Aquaman was great, it was especially terrible. if you're a woman who just wants to stare at Jason Momoa for forty-five minutes. Because right, that's forty-five that. minutes of that movie that was, so that was just Jason Momoa being Aqua Bro. Dude, there had to be that whole <laughs> middle section because I was interested in the beginning. Then that whole middle section, that second act. Yep. I was like, did James Wan? Did they take it away from him for this section? It feels like that writing just changed abruptly. And, yeah. and the look. Oh, well, see, the look was okay, but it was that underwater look that was hard no, to No, the water. middle section think? that was not underwater. Oh, oh, okay. It did not seem in about. place because yeah, yeah. then it got back to it. And then there was a lot of plot holes yep. with everything that was going on yeah. because it just seemed so out of place. Like his trident that he was able to get, like, what? Now, almost, it was supposed to be a main story, then became a side story, and then all of a sudden he just had it. It was so weird. And Manta just... with his Black Manta was cool. Black Manta was really cool. Black Manta was cool, man. Uh, that actor. Am I drawing a blank? Peter, uh, he was great. Oh, what is his name? He's the Conjuring guy. <laughs> uh, Patrick he? Wilson. No, oh, that's not Black Manta. That was wasn't that Black Manta? No, Black Manta was uh, what's his name? He was the the African American guy. Um, that's Black Manta. Uh, oh my God, why am I drawing a blank on his name? Because he was great in the Houston? first Purge. 
His character is my favorite character in the Purge movies. Um, no, what is this? Uh, let me look it up real quick. Because it's going to drive me crazy if so, I don't know what wait, it is. Wait, Patrick Wilson was who again in that? Who's his brother? Uh, what's his name? Uh, King Orn. That's right, King Orn. Thank uh, you. I, I hope I don't ruin this. But it's uh, Yaya Abdul Mateen II. Okay. He's my favorite character in the first Purge. He was awesome. <laughs> and he was such a badass. I'm like, this dude should be in more action. The movies. soldier? Yeah, and he was, uh, no. Well, he was a soldier, but he was the drug kingpin. Yeah, oh, oh, oh okay. Uh, he was the badass on the Yeah, Sandra. yeah, yeah. Um, I, I just... Uh, you mean the movie The First Purge. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I keep thinking I'm you're talking sorry. about the first Purge movie. No, I'm In which sorry. case, yeah, I was like, wait a minute. I should have <laughs> clarified. That was stupid of me. Um, Boy, they are confusing. No, he was so good in that movie, the first Purge. The mm-hmm. first. Yes. The, the fourth movie, I think it was. Um, that I woke up to him, and then when I saw that he was in Aquaman, I was really excited. He was playing Black Ground, mm-hmm. Black Manta, and I'm like, all right, I can't wait for this. Right. And he was great in it. He was the only thing that was great in that movie. See, I think everything had moments of greatness in that movie. I think overall, once again, fell short. It went the full DC route, and it went back to a five. Like every other DC movie has done, it mm-hmm. went back to a five. Because Dawn, uh, Dawn of Justice, Batman vs. Superman is a three to me. Then yeah. you get all the way out to, um, the, what is it, the Dawn of Justice of the Super Friends or whatever, when they all get together, right? And he, no, Superman, Justice League is the one. Oh, uh, Justice League, yeah. So that was a two. Because I was miserable with that, because I didn't like any of the characters except Wonder Woman. Yeah. Wonder Woman was the only character who played. Yeah, but the I mean, only yeah, one. Her movie was taken so seriously and put together yeah. right, and then I watched something like Captain Marvel, and I'm like, "You're you're basically with this movie telling me like, this is like Wonder Woman, but Marvel," and I'm like, "No, it's not." I was like, "You can't muscle me in on this." Like, Wonder Woman is a good movie that took it seriously. This is a movie that doesn't take itself seriously. You're just saying it took itself seriously and that we should respect it because as a female lead. I'll respect any movie it has as if it has a good actor. I don't yeah. care if it's male, female, whatever. I'll res- you know, a dog's life or a dog's journey or whatever it is, it's a good movie. Um, and that's all about the dog. Mm-hmm. You know, like mm-hmm. I will respect it if there's a good performance mm-hmm. in it. Uh, it just wasn't well put together. Now, Brie Larson is not a bad actress. She's very good. I mean, you can't watch, you know, uh, Room and not think that. Yeah. Like, you're an idiot if you you think she's a bad actress. It's just not possible. Do you think she's a fighter pilot? I she think that's, be, I think that's the biggest thing. Well or directed well that, as a fighter I think pilot. that's the biggest part, is it, do you believe she is what that character is supposed to be? No. I believe Gal Gadot is Princess Diana. You can't yeah. tell me she's not. I believe Anne... Hathaway is Catwoman. You can't tell me she's not. She is a version of Selena Kyle that I 100% I buy. You know, there are a lot of characters like that that I yeah. buy. Henry Cavill, he is Superman. You can't tell me he's not. He yeah. was fantastic. I loved his character. Whatever DC has done when they put all of these characters in the same room just literally explodes and falls apart. <laughs> it's never like got, it yeah, just, I don't think they ever under... Eh, I mean, yeah, I liked Henry Cavill as... Um, but he just... He, just because I liked him doesn't mean he was a great superman. Oh, no, of course good. not. Yeah. I mean, he was fine. But listen, but he was, they had enough pieces to move forward with something good. They screwed up Superman first. Mm-hmm. Because Superman... Well, that's fair. But the reason being is what he got to at the end of Justice League mm-hmm. is what he should have been, just the world didn't see it. Yeah, fair. And, but what they, and I understand the struggle. He's always struggling, but this is who he is. Yeah. So like, he is this guy who realizes, no, I'm always going to choose to save and, and mm-hmm. be this hero not police not be a god nothing like that mm-hmm. I'm just this guy who is here as a protector um, and he is that wholesome guy that's who he is Yeah. and down to his core and then he has internal battles because it's like but I could just end it all you know kill these villains and be done but I can't do that because that's not who I am right you know so like I love that and I love that part of Superman and he could have played that really well they didn't make those movies that's the problem. They didn't make those movies. Zack Snyder didn't come through with those movies. Yeah. You know, a lot of stuff was shoehorned where you should never have dreamt of shoehorning 
some things in. But and I will not come out and say that on air. That's what Captain Marvel was for me. Captain see, Marvel and I, was shoehorning. She was as believable a fighter pilot as Tom Cruise is. See, I, and I thought Tom Cruise was a believable fighter pilot. When? Be, be, in Top Gun. Are you kidding me? Have you ever met a fighter pilot? <laughs> not Maverick. <laughs> come on. Come on. No. The more Seriously, believable those fighter guys pilot are straight Val Kilmer. Kilmer. Yeah. Exactly the same. Not, All talking about their dongs, humping chicks, and flying balls Fine, out. I'm talking like, about an actual fighter pilot. Right. As in, as in uh, part of a team. He has a wingman. He takes that seriously. This is, no, that takes is true. Orders, okay, that like is that. true. They did legitimately name him Maverick and make him the guy who doesn't work with other people when the entire point of the military is to work with everyone around you, and that's how you get better. So, like, yes. I, don't, I don't care about the Captain Marvel character, uh, Carol Danvers, mm -hmm. Um, I don't mind that she's a fighter pilot, mm -hmm. but if you're going to tell me that she had to fight her whole life to become a fighter pilot, she can't be at the top of her game. Like she can't have the job because that's not what it was back then. But she's going to change things. She didn't change things. She was at the top of her game. She was the best fighter pilot. She was okay. It doesn't feel like you're fighting the times. It, 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 it See, no, like I understand that, and I get that idea. But then I think they kind of wrap that story up saying yeah she was at the top of her game but she was a woman she wasn't allowed to go fight that was the whole point so her and her other fighter pilot buddy they were both working with oh, I can't remember the actress's name it's going to kill me in that betting oh, so yeah. they were working with her yeah, test because, pilots. yeah they were test pilots so yeah no it fits you know test pilot okay and I think that fits for the Carol Danvers side and honestly it was kind of weird because I also felt like Ryan Reynolds would have been up there flying with him and we could have had Green yeah, Lantern right. on one side of the show. That's shore. how believable <laughs> she was. That's how believable she was. She was as believable as Green Lantern. I 100%. You uh, know, I 100% agree with you, and I actually am still bitter to this day that Green Lantern got as much flack as it did. Yeah. I don't care that it's a four. I love it. It can be a four all day. I love it. <laughs> it's one of those movies. So it's great. It just wasn't... It wasn't taken seriously, in my opinion. I, it was like, yeah. Yeah, I think they sacrificed taking a serious movie... With the, you have a great actress playing a great role that's going to go on and do great things and take over, uh, essentially take over the Avengers. Yeah. And you were more worried about making the movie woke than making a good movie. And I hate that. That's fair. No, I completely understand you that. You can make a woke movie. movie that is good yes. if you focus on the good. Exactly. And I'm fine with that. I don't care if you what you were telling me. I don't care what message you're trying to get across to me as long as you make a good movie behind it. Get out. Boom. Boom! Right there. Oh my god. It's perfect. And it's a horror movie, so I love it. Yep. Um, Managed to tie it right back. <laughs> yeah. A completely woke movie yep. that makes you think. Yep. And But you don't, like, the crazy thing is, that was one of those few movies that has had me locked into the point. And this is what Jordan Peele does very well. And I actually really love him because it's that Rod Serling effect mm -hmm. where they kind of just, they, may, they mundane you in. They mundane you in, and they mundane you in, and before you know it, it's too late, and you're indoctrinated, and you're part of whatever this story is. And yeah. it's scary, because you can't get out. Well, it's, <laughs> and it's I think all the that's, subtleties you pick up on. That's why yes. I like Us, as well. Which I still haven't seen. I don't know why oh, I waited so long to see that. Watch that before Halloween, because I would okay. like to talk about that. I'm in. I definitely want to get your feelings on that. That might be a good dinner and a movie night. I think I might do something like that this week. I like it. I dig it. Although, uh, it's not as exciting as what else we have going this week. What's this week? Tuesday. Tuesday night. Oh my God! We have the greatest event, and I have to talk about it beforehand because we fun. need we need to do a show immediately following. I feel like. Oh, you want to come back here and do a show? I would like that if that's cool with you. I think that works. Okay, Unless cool. we get invited out to hang out. With well, we get more hanging out with Joe Bob. Are you kidding me? All right, so like I'll send afterwards. Like we'll see where it goes. Yeah. I'll send Mary home. Okay. I didn't feel like it. Unless she wants to hang out. Yeah, whatever. But yeah. like you know, try and like talk to Joe Bob a little bit and yeah. come home. And, yeah, no, you were literally like just. This is gonna I be the first. This is gonna be the first five minutes of that show. Just, He's signing just my squealing. Book. Oh, I want him God. to sign my favorite article. I want him to sign Hail to the King Baby shirt. My Hail to the King Baby shirt. I want him and because. Why? So oh, it's it's important for me because that was one of the first times I saw Army of Darkness. Oh, on a show. It was on Monster Vision. Okay. So, like, Monster Vision is really what tied me into all of this. This is what built our friendship as children, was Monster Vision for me. That was Like, you had the other ones. To. You had Sven Gulli. You, you were a little more into the old I didn't have Sven Gulli. I found Sven Gulli older. Oh, really? 
Yeah, you told me about Sven Bully when oh, I moved right. here. Yeah, you were oh, like, crap. I forgot all about that. You're yeah. like, oh, because I was always talking the about Nick Marcos. and Nick Yeah, and we would talk That's about Joe Bob, and you were like, dude, you should check out Sven. Because I watched some of Sven Gulli and also uh, Monster Madhouse is another fun one. Every once in a while, yeah. I check out. It's so out there. But I know it's really out there. Sven Gulli is goofy, but I love it. I oh, think yeah. it's great. Elvira was always classic because I didn't even know Elvira had a show where she hosted horror movies. Movie I had no idea. Yeah. Like, I didn't know about her until almost five years when I was almost done with Joe Bob. I think he was actually getting canceled at the time I learned about Elvira. 2000, he got canceled. Okay, so yeah. It was it was right around that time because I would have been 12 in 95. So that was it. That was when I started watching. No, he was eating up in 95. That was off the heels of the Casino. Okay, then that's when I was they watching. They were still doing horror movies. Yeah. They were still yep. doing, like, the cold movies. I love so. that, man. I love his Monster Vision. But Monster Vision, for me, is really what drew me into everything. And, I mean, between They Live which is one of the greatest things I watched him do. Mm-hmm. It was him hosting that. Uh, Return of the Living Dead, always one of my favorites. And him hosting that made it even better. You know, Maximum Overdrive, my favorite Stephen King movie, really is Opus Day. I think we can all agree. It's the greatest Stephen King product ever. Of course. Uh, Maximum Overdrive. I mean, why wouldn't we say that? But I mean, fools would only believe otherwise. I mean, The Shining or nothing, but... What? The Shinnin? <laughs> you want to get sued? <laughs> you want to get sued, boy. So yeah, Joe Bob, Tuesday. Super excited. Thank you, oh thank you, Psycho Cinema. This is, once again, Psycho, Psycho Cinema, Cinema putting a lot of stuff together that we will absolutely pimp all day. Dude, get them movies. Start sponsoring their stuff. They're awesome. Because um, this is phenomenal, and I cannot wait to meet Joe Bob Briggs. I can't it is going to be so cool. I mean, he inspired you to be a writer, and he inspired me in, into a genre. Yeah, like he brought me. Yeah, you definitely me. bring your moderating and uh, with the podcast and stuff. And like we've been doing this a lot of years. Mm, yeah. So just because it's a new show, <laughs> we have two new shows now. Yes. <laughs> uh, make sure you check out on Wednesday the twenty minute wrestling, the scene snobs twenty minute wrestling podcast uh, for all you wrestling fans out there. Um, Jesus, I can't believe we came up with our own show twenty minutes. With this. <laughs> just, yeah, just. Randomly bumbled into it. <laughs> I love it. Um, I am super excited to meet Joe Bob. So let's save it. Oh, yeah, yeah. I want to get into something else real quick before we yes. wrap up the show. But, uh, okay, if you want to do a show afterwards. If we're not hanging out drinking with Joe Bob, yes, we can do okay, a show afterwards. Okay, cool. Or, or we could do a drunk show after that. I say we do a the drunk Joe, show after the Joe that. Bob drunk special. Um, <laughs> Where last call. Last call with Joe Bob. Get him on the show. Oh. Joe Bob. Joe Bob. Drunk. We got a podcast. Come and, <laughs> come and talk to us. Oh, we call. have them laughing the whole time. They might. You never know. Well, we got to be on our A game then. So, I mean, uh, I wouldn't mind taking her, Captain. Oh, my God. That is so... Oh, my God. It's still the best line in movie history. It's one of my favorite lines I've ever seen in my entire life, and I'll hold on to that line forever, and we will still not know what... Who is she? I, I wouldn't mind taking her, Captain. What? what? His wife. <laughs> I don't know about that. Yeah, if she's all right. I wouldn't mind taking her. Can't even tell you the movie. It was like this. It was like Doctor Something and the Swamp People from the sixties. So out there. I loved it though. But being able to fly a plane right into a bar. Right next to a bar is like the front door. Yeah, sorry, you don't fly 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 into into the bar. Yeah, fair. Um, (laughs) Anyway, let's change that that dynamic. Uh, We should ask him about that movie though. Yes, we should. Um, But no. uh, What is it? Uh, Oh. Oh, we talked about Creep Show. Creep Show, and I want to because we talked about Jordan Peele, Twilight Zone, yes. uh, touched down on that. I wanted to finish off with you having watched the first episode. Yes, I, I have now seen all three. So, so okay, I want to cover each one each week. Yes, agreed. All right, well, let's start with number one because I am yeah. a huge Creep Show fan. Creep Show for me was yes. greater than Tales from Dark Side. That was that your was thing. just I. That's the era I came from, and those were the movies I saw more frequently. Or I was more Tales from the Crypt. Exactly. Tales from the Crypt, Demon Knight is the only one that I ever held up, because I didn't watch Bordello of Blood. I didn't see a lot of the other ones. Don't tell me. But Creepshow was my damn. What are they, demons or something? Of course. Demons. Ha <laughs> ha, got him. <sighs> but that Creepshow's fantastic. So this first episode came out, and I was really excited to watch it. And I was not disappointed one little bit. Now, unlike Three from Hell, which I was kind of half washing, half folding laundry, half building a costume, half doing, you know, it's like you're just torn away. Creepshow was the other way where I was half doing something to start, and then immediately everything was put down after about 15 minutes in. I was mm-hmm. into it. So, so they got me. They did a great job. They have pulled me in completely. 
and I cannot wait to go home and watch the second episode. I can't wait for you to watch the second episode. Because the second episode looks like it's going to ramp up and be just as good, if not better. So Shudder has been doing a fantastic job. I don't even know who's doing these. I need to find Greg Nicotero. Greg Nicotero, that's right. Thank and you. Yes. Joe Hill is written for it. Okay. Uh, Stephen King is written for it. Wow. They've got, uh, and they're getting all these actors in there. Like, yeah. I mean, look, the first episode, you have Adrian Rabot, you have Tobin Bell, mm-hmm. you have Giancarlo Esposito, Right there, that's some solid acting. Dude, and the, having Jim Carlo Esposito and Tobin Bell reminded me of that Poker Night movie. Like, because the, the oh, sheriffs yes. hanging out and having that conversation. So they got a lot of good... Uh, the atmosphere. The atmosphere was built perfectly. Yes. Oh, they building did that, up the story the whole yes, time? Yes, just Absolutely. talking about the story and then the old lady having the conversation with him. But he's my dad. You know, and like that, that twist, that creep quit, show does. Which hit you in the heart. Because uh-huh. you're like, he said he would quit. And he said like, he quit, yeah. This kid just believes his dad. It's yeah. his dad. Of course. And I, I didn't realize, I, I mean, it's a while back, but like, uh, I didn't realize that that was a Stephen King short. Really? Yeah, he wrote a short story called Grey Manor, which is very which similar is in vain. Yeah, exactly. Because as soon as I saw it, I was like, all right, I got your cell. Um... I knew the book, but I didn't. I didn't realize that that's what that was. Yeah. I didn't put the correlate. Like they together. they did that beautifully. Like I love that first. I, and the the jump scare was what Creep Show was. It was as creepy in the atmosphere that it built as it was the here's the hit. And the yeah. hit was quick, fast, ten seconds, you're done. Because yeah. now you've hit enough to go. Oh wow, this isn't going to end. Oh, this absolutely. is like this is going on. So it was really neat. I really love that one. But. My favorite and still my favorite out of all of them so far is the head in the house, the head in the room. Yeah. Uh, yeah, head in the house, room. Whew. Which was, it's it's beautiful, man. It's a beautiful story. Yeah. And to think, the real horror movie is what's going on it's with those people in house. that dollhouse. Yeah. Like you could tell a movie about that. But they told us a 10 or 15 minute short that is just as terrifying, just as chilling and thrilling and everything else with this little girl just discovering these different rooms in the dollhouse. Mm -hmm. No context. Nope. Has no idea. None. Just knows that this little zombie head has something to do with it and she keeps trying to fix it. Dude, and my favorite part of that entire story, because when that little girl grabs that head... I'm going to ruin this. Sorry, guys. When that little girl throws it. Spoiler alert. Yeah. Spoiler, spoiler, spoiler. When she throws it and says, get out. Yeah. And then realizes, what, two minutes later, like, I can't have that here. I have to get it out of my room, too. Yeah. Brilliant. The the reveal there, perfect. Yes. And and you can even see it. You can see it coming a mile away. It doesn't matter. It's yeah. perfect. It's Creepshow. That's what Creepshow does. It tells you a tiny snippet. You see the story. You know what's going to happen. still creeps you out. Yes. Because it's the lead up to it. So it's you may understand it in the first two minutes, but it doesn't matter because it's what, how you get there that matters. It's more the journey than the destination. And I think that's what Creepshow's always done really well. Yeah. Tales from the Dark Side, 50-50. I think they, they like to twist the destination, but they also like they have a great time along the way, you know? So very, very similar cups of tea. Yes. <laughs> it was, it's still tea altogether. And I'm super excited to go home and watch that first Wolfman episode. Because <laughs> episode two is the Wolfman, so we'll see what we get out of it. And That's I, a really cool World War II wolf story. Right. Werewolf story. Right. And the second one, was, I actually liked better. But I'm okay. going to leave that open for you. Yes, because I can't wait to I see it. I did love the first one. I loved yeah, the The first one was just a great intro. What a great way to say we're back. Third one was really and, good. And lest we forget, do you notice who that Indian is that she put in there? No. She put that little Indian, that Native American, in there, right? I remember. Do you remember that in Creep Show? Oh yeah, yeah, it's the wooden, the uh, wooden Indian, the wooden Indian <clears throat> from Creep Show two, yep. two, right? Yep, Creep Show two. Yeah, with the gas station Indian. Yep. You know who that was? No. So what's his name on uh, Mindhunter? Lou um, Diamond Phillips. <laughs> about. I don't know, I just like to say I'm so confused because now I'm thinking about the uh, now I'll just throw everything out the, of like first power that's all I'm thinking about <laughs> um, Thunder Ridge or whatever that oh was. my god Thunder. no no Mindhunter's the TV show yes which one? Oh, uh, the detective yeah the FBI agent the older one yeah the older yeah, one yeah, 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 he was, yep. uh, so yep. he was a creature character which is why I love seeing him 
Yeah, it's great. That show. It's, we could we could analyze that show for Oh yeah, that Mindhunter is phenomenal. But, but I will say, Creep Show gets it's like I said the uh, the Head in the Room is is my favorite yeah. one so far. I think it's either Head in the House or Head in the Room. I feel so unprepared. Um, <laughs> Today we're a little bit we're a little, we're out, a little out of it. We I'm up all night watching movies. Exactly, You're I'm all over the place. Camping, you know, you know, like it's it's crazy putting together costumes and whatnot. So it's yeah. been it's been a wild week. So, uh, but yeah, fortunately, we managed to power through the important things we wanted to discuss this week and hit our main topics. I do want to touch back. I want to start a new trend on this. Okay, at the end of every show, mm-hmm. I want to I want us to recommend a movie that we. We both seen, we both like. Okay, but that is maybe a little more obscure. Somebody hasn't seen, or sure. it could be big, but like, why we haven't seen it in a while? Maybe yeah. something like that. Yeah, and I think you touched down on it perfectly. To this week's recommendation for any, especially horror fans, but just good, chilling or thrilling a movie. You know, a good thriller. Watch Poker Night. Yeah, Poker Night. Uh, if you have not seen it, it is legitimately one of my favorite atmospheric tales. Uh-huh. Uh, the way they go through and use the the camera works phenomenal. The atmosphere is wonderful. Use of stories in the story is one of my favorite things. Whenever you can do that, you have tied me to two characters now. You know, the person telling the story, person receiving the story. And in this case, that just builds. They compound on that. Yeah. And that is a really fun little trope that I don't think is used enough because it goes back to the Kung Fu master, the one who was always taught, you know, the, uh-huh. the one who taught the one who needs to use that same knowledge. Uh, so it's really well done, and I highly recommend Poker Night. is definitely a way to go. Yeah. All right, well, I think this is a pretty solid place to stop. I agree. Um, listen, anybody listening, send us... Uh just follow us. Let's talk about uh, yes, our Yes, please Instagram. follow us. Right now, uh, yeah, I am like currently uh, Instagram at Plotinus21, I believe. Yeah. So hit me up there. Uh, I will be starting the Commander and Geek shortly. Uh, once I do that, we'll have all that, all that information up for you. So you can follow, you can like us, you can belittle us and put us down as much to your heart's content. <laughs> Whatever you feel is good. All right, so I, you can follow me at the Scene Snob on Twitter, at the Scene Snob on Facebook, and at the Scene Snob on Instagram. Uh, there will be plenty of updates coming up. Every Monday is a new episode. Check us out on YouTube, SoundCloud, and soon to be Stitcher. And the pointless to do iTunes because they're going away. <laughs> so uh, we'll just stick with uh, those three for now. Uh, but definitely check us out. Uh, the channel is the Scene Snob channel on YouTube. And that's it. And also Wednesday, check out our brand new show. Brand new. The Scene Snob 20-Minute Wrestling Podcast. Oh, yeah. So if you're a wrestling fan, check that out. We definitely are going to get into some We things. think you'll be big fans if you check it out. So get on over to the show every Wednesday. That is a cocaine-filled promo if I've ever heard one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Good night.